Hello, friends, and welcome to our first episode in English. Uh, we wanted to do a cybersecurity-focused episode for a while, and recently Ratio Spring Forum presented an opportunity. We got to discuss cybersecurity with Luca Viganò, one of the speakers at the forum. Luca is a vice dean and head of cybersecurity group at King's College London. He's a professor of computer science, focusing on formal methods to prove system security. On the more informal side, Luca has a fun way of explaining security through fairy tales, and you get to hear how the Cinderella tale can be used to explain two-factor authentication to anyone. The podcast partner is Ontotext, a company whose technology helps people make sense of data. Their products are being developed by smart people here in Bulgaria and used by smart people all over the world. And now on to our discussion with Luca. Hello, Luca. Welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Hi, nice to be here. <laughs> so you just landed in Sofia yesterday. How was your first evening here? <laughs> uh, it was very, very interesting. It was nice to come to a warm place and very welcoming place as far as I've seen. So uh, it was a nice experience. Glad, glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. <clears throat> so you'll be speaking Saturday on the Big Ratio Forum uh, on the topic of cybersecurity. And that's that's what uh, I would also like to discuss with you today. Um, so as our, our audience, of course, uh, uh, is uh, very, very diverse, but everybody nowadays has contact with security. Everybody has passwords. Uh, everybody has like one time security codes and everybody hates it. <laughs> so, so like in casual conversations, a lot of people would like come with a, come up with a question like, why is it so hard? Why is it so complicated? They kind of feel that physical keys and like the way to lock your door and car are somewhat better. So why is it so hard, uh, the cybersecurity in your view? Okay, let me give you two different answers. I'll give you a very short technical answer and then a more detailed non-technical answer. So the technical answer is the following. Imagine that you have a system, you know, the system of your bank, for instance, and you want to prove it secure, mathematically secure. Why is that difficult? Well, because we need to assume the presence of an attacker. That's the whole point, right? Security is a defense against attackers. So what we do, what people like me who are security experts do, we model the system and we model the attacker. And we try to see, is there anything that the attacker can do that would break the system? For instance, you know, enter into the bank, uh, pretend to be one of the customers and the like. Now, in order to prove it secure, you need to assume the strongest possible attacker, right? Because it would help you very little to say, oh, it is secure against an attacker who is a beginner, yeah. uh, but then it's insecure against a professional, right? So if you assume the strongest possible attacker, then you need to assume that there is always something else that the attacker could do. So whatever system you have to reason about it, it would never terminate because there is always something that the attacker would do. That is the technical explanation why it is mathematically difficult. Like it's in, in an infinite problem. Exactly, exactly. You run into an infinite problem. Now, we, need, we know how to deal with infinity because we know how to prove properties of numbers, for instance, <laughs> which are infinite, but we can still prove properties. But with security, it becomes more difficult because the attacker can always do something else, something that you have not thought about, something that you have not modeled, and so it becomes difficult. So that is why there is work for people like us, you know, like me, who are working on coming up with models uh, and trying to see if, to prove systems secure. The uh, less technical okay. answer oh. is the following. It is difficult because it is a pervasive problem. It is a problem that used to be restricted to those who had information to keep secure. So, you know, the government, the military, maybe a few rich people. Nowadays, everybody has interactions with the internet. Now, I say everybody, of course, being very conscious that there are large parts of the world where there is no electricity at all. And, and But so, it's still yeah. not that much exactly. right now. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, it is difficult because everybody has 
some information that they put online, has some interactions that they carry out online with your bank, with your government to pay your taxes, to renew your passport and the like, or you know, to carry out some, some other transactions online. And therefore, it is such a pervasive problem that the attack points, the entry points, the vulnerability, the attack surfaces, as experts would say, have become so variegated, so different, that it's really difficult to keep everything secure, to trace the whole peri perimeter. You know, it's like if you have a blanket and the blanket is too short, either your feet or your head will be cold. And, and that is more or less a simple explanation of why it is difficult. Yeah, so the attack surface in this case is like having multiple accounts for multiple things and, and compromising one can lead to compromises of another. Exactly. Oh, I have a question about the Ten. technical challenge. So you said that there we assume the strongest attacker and this is probably not the way we treat like our the locks to our homes <laughs> because like the lock in my home that even the average locks me to will, will go yeah. through. So... Is it fair to say that we are trying to make these systems much more secure than the physical systems we are used to? Because when people talk about convenience of security, they kind of mean their home and their car but, yeah. and their wallet. And and they're, and that now, now this, this, the, the IT systems we are holding up to a much higher level of, of with what you said, like the strongest possible attacker. Absolutely. And, and, and that is a good example and it's a good metaphor, actually. Um, you know, if somebody enters in my home, they will be able to steal stuff. But that's it, right? So I'm the person who is being attacked and I lose my stuff. I lose my, my TV, my, my computer, I have some money and everything, but that's it. If we look, think about the digital world, things are different. So for instance, why would people be interested in attacking me in my account at King's College London, right? So, well, my students could be interested in cracking my password, let's say, and entering on my laptop because they want to see the exam. Right before I actually get or it change to them. the yeah. grades directly. Or, well, <laughs> changing the grades is, is 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 different, but you know they might want to access the exam, and 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 actually I do tell my students. So I teach cryptography, and I and I do tell my students, well, don't do it. But actually, if you were able to break into my laptop and and see the exam, in a sense, you have already passed the exam, right? So <laughs> because you're good enough to do that, but but that is interesting but only up to a point. You know, people might break into my bank account and steal my money, which would be a huge nuisance for me, but it's still very limited. M many of the problems that we have these days around digital security is that attacking an individual is only an entry point to attack an organization. So for instance, somebody would be interested in my account at King's College London, not to attack me, but rather to enter into the system and maybe, you know, encrypt the data of King's College and ask for blackmail money or uh, deface the w websites or something like that. So in that sense, the, uh, this is where the analogy breaks. If you enter in somebody's apartment, it's limited. If you enter in my account, you can maybe do a lot more than just stealing my stuff. The blast radius of the of exactly. the of the is, is much larger. Okay, yeah, that's that's why we have to treat it to a yeah. to a bigger degree. But still, uh, and also, if I may add, no. also it is easier to replicate an attack online. So to to break into my apartment, there is actually labor involved, right? So if I have a decent lock locking my door or, you know, decent windows, you actually need to, to, to put in some effort to, to enter into the flat. And actually, you also have a high percentage of risk because somebody could see you, the neighbors could hear the noise and stuff like that. An attack online, first of all, is typically much, much easier to do. You can do it from your home with your laptop and everything as a, as a hacker. Um, there is no noise, so there are no neighbors who will alert, uh, hear, you know, hear the windows breaking and, and, and call the police. There is 
typically no alarm system. I mean, there are some monitors online, but mm -hmm. they're not the equivalent of the online ones. So in that sense, it's actually, and, and it's much easier to replicate. Because, it scales better. Exactly. Like everything in IP, exactly. it scales better. Exactly. You have one Facebook, not hundreds of Facebooks. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I, I, do, I do get that part. It's still that, uh, I want to, Go into the topic of like why is it so why it's still the digital security is somewhat harder than the than the mm -hmm. than the than the physical one. Like uh, people don't read manuals these days. Do they do they need to read a manual for? Do, how, how are we? Because as security gets more complex, we kind of want the good old school manual or at least somebody to be min minimally prepared. It cannot be because convenience and security are counterparts. Yeah. If you m try to make it extremely convenient, it it's insecure at some point. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, uh, I'm old enough to remember the very first phones, not smartphones, mobile phones. Okay. And let me show you. This is my mobile phone today. It's very thin. And my first mobile phone was this thick. Yeah, that and it actually came it. with a manual that was even thicker. Now, obviously, nobody read that manual, and that is part of the problem, right? When when you have too much information, the standard citizen will not devote the time to reading the manual, and understandably so. So, what have we done? What have we experts done? What have corporations done? We have made things thinner, <laughs> and and this is obviously much more convenient because it's thinner, you know, you can carry it in your pocket without destroying your pants and everything. But there is no manual. There is no manual. For a smartphone, there's exactly. no manual. And the idea is that it is plug and play, right? It is so simple and so intuitive that everybody can use it from the start. And you know what? To some extent, that is true. But it neglects the fact that there should be some instructions around its security. For instance, you know, there should be some instructions on why it is important to set up your phone with a pin or with uh, your, your fingerprint or with your retina scan to unlock it. Because I see way too many phones out there, you know, and I, I take the tube in London, I take the bus, and I can see people who just flip on their phone and that's it. And, and so if, if that phone is lost or stolen, People can enter and see all your data. So there are some people who actually use pins. Typically, it's one, two, three, four. So it's probably it's, the most common. Or, <laughs> exactly. Or, or reverse. <laughs> or one, 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 one. But you know, or but they're not particularly secure. So they can be cracked. They can be broken simply by trying out all the different possibilities. But people don't really understand, and to some extent, is is not their fault the need to secure it. And why do I say it's to some extent is not their fault? Because I feel that we have made things a little bit too simple. Uh, we don't really talk about the dangers of security so often. You know, people often, and I, and, and I talk a lot about I try to evangelize the need for cybersecurity a lot. And, you know, uh, people ask me, well, but why would an, an attacker be... What's the worst that's going to exactly. happen if they know my password? Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, there is, there is quite a lot that can happen. Obviously, they can <laughs> enter the organization and everything. But even as an individual, you ha we have quite a lot of information. Oh, of course, our lives are online. Yeah. Like, if, if somebody has an access to your Facebook, to your exactly. Amazon... It's a it's a trove of information. It's source of extortion. Absolutely. Uh, uh, or they can encrypt everything, or they can uh, clone your personality online and and and, and do terrible things. So that generally, I, take upon credit exactly. on your name. Like that's absolutely. that's the very basic. Like <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. You know, uh, a few years ago, it's not possible anymore. But a few years ago, one of my PhD students found an attack on 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 Facebook, which was very very interesting. So you could create an alternative page for somebody, uh, just, you know, you could download their picture, create an alternative page, convince through social engineering, a few other friends to move to that account. And then when you had a large enough number of friends on this account, you could contact Facebook and tell them, oh, the original account is a fake one. My, this is the original one. And they would consider it. I mean, now they've, they've gotten much better and it's much more protected. They're much better. Yeah, yeah, much, 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 much better. better. But, but originally, you could do these simple, very, very simple attacks with very little effort and you would succeed.
And, you know, maybe having your identity stolen is not the end of the world, but it can be a traumatic experience. It can be a problem in terms of, you know, your, your money, your credit, as you were saying, you know, the, the, the things that f people post. We live in an era of post-truth, of fake news. People could try to, you know, post things online pretending to be you and, and, and you know, with extreme political views or extreme religious views or something like that. Or just chat your mom, mom in trouble, Absolutely. send me some money. <laughs> Absolutely. Actually, <laughs> to this new bank account. <laughs> actually, exactly. Yeah, yeah, you know, my mom, who is 88, she showed me an a text message that she received last week, which was precisely, mom, this is my new phone number, please. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And if it's the real identity, if it comes from your Facebook that she yeah. used to chat exactly. with you, the trust is there. Like exactly. I'm, I'm also like, I'm also dealing with my older parents yeah. and, and their contacts with banks and Facebooks. And it's, I see it's yeah. totally confusing for them. And since there's no manual, uh, what, what, what else can we do? Well, we can, we can try to stop blaming the citizens and the users. You know, much of the work that I do is not just targeting the general public, which is important, but also targeting my colleagues. Because it is true, as we often say, that people are the weakest link. Right, and it is true. It is a mat you know, it is a matter of fact. Yes, people are often the weakest link in a system because uh, you can program your 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 computer networks to be secure. You can put monitors. You can you can do a lot of things through programming and hardware, so through software and hardware. But then suddenly you get your standard user who has a very weak password that people can guess. They can enter as that person and they enter the system and they can subvert the system in a number of ways. So that is true. But what I maintain is that we should stop blaming people because we are really putting them in a fairly impossible position. You know, we are asking them to be part of the defense. So in a sense, we have enrolled them in the military you know, without them. Just as we yeah. gave them a key exactly. to their apartment. Right? Exactly. <laughs> and We are asking them to behave in a secure way without really explaining what it means, without really explaining what are the dangers, without really explaining to people what they should be doing and what they should not be doing. Yes, people hear, oh yeah, of course you need to change your password. But then, you need, then they hear the same thing from every single account that they have. You need to change your password and it needs to be long and it needs to be complicated and it needs to contain special characters and numbers and everything, which is all good. But now put yourself in the shoe of, shoes of somebody who is not a security expert, who receives all these requests from 10, 20 different accounts. Really people have a, around 100 accounts exactly. now. And, and what, what are they going to do? They're going to do exactly what they should not be doing. Namely, they're going to use the same password everywhere. They're going to use passwords that are easy to remember. They're going to write down the passwords somewhere Honestly. in a non-protected <laughs> way. And, and that is fine. That is human. I think we experts, we need to stop thinking that we are dealing with humans, but we treat them as computers. <clears throat> we need to treat them as humans. And we need to understand, we need to explain to them that, for instance, you know, if they want to uh, protect the password of their uh, weekly soccer, uh, soccer club or something like that, then it is tolerable if the password is not that great. Actually, you should question why should a weekly soccer match club have a password, but often these days there is one. Uh, but then we should tell them there are some some interactions that you have online where you really need to put in some effort. And we need to give them options. So, you know, passwords is, is, is one of the easiest examples, but it's not the only one. For instance, people don't really understand multi-factor authentication or one-time one -time keys or one-time passwords these days. They find them a nuisance because why would you need to have a password and then receive a text message or then, you know, have to go to an app and authenticate yourself. Can't you do only one? This is a question that I'm often asked. Uh, or they think, oh, 
I will receive a text message on my phone anyway. So my password at the beginning, that can be weak. This is true. We've kind of given up on passwords because what you, what you describe, like the average person right now cannot survive on the internet yeah. without a hundred accounts. So if he has to have a strong, different password, there is like, I use a password manager and probably a lot of IT professionals yeah. do, but otherwise without having a password manager, it's impossible to actually have 100 unique passwords that you remember. So, so, and this is what, what I see companies do like almost all important account, just they, they rely on the push notification notification on the one time Absolutely. code on the on the second layer more than the first the first is just like hello yeah yeah, yeah. The, fir the first one is, is, is a handshake basically yeah <laughs> i mean yes okay let's talk and then let's let's get let's business. really check yeah. who you are which is which is fine as far as i'm concerned as long as that is clear i don't think we are really being very clear with the public about that you know because Yes, it is true that you have a number of factors because they will protect the system better because even if one of them is weak, then at least the other ones will provide some guarantee. If one of them is broken, you have the other ones for resilience, which is fantastic. But on the other hand, we're not being totally explicit about that. We're not, we're not really doing an effort, I believe, as experts, as developers, as analysts, which is what I do, in explaining that to the public. And then what will happen is that people, like electrons, they will find the path of least resistance. They will write down their passwords. Some of them will use a password manager. Great. I wonder yes. what the password of the password manager is, because that is a problem, <laughs> right? Because you're concentrating everywhere in one place. Uh, uh, it's again something yeah. you own, something you no, know. No, we exactly. have to have the vault file, but I, I, <coughs> I do see like if it's if it's a password manager with one password, yeah. it has to be really, really Absolutely. secure and never written down or seen on the screen in exactly. these days. No, and I think we need to be very honest with people. We need to tell people, listen, we understand that it is a nuisance. We understand that things are difficult. We understand that we're asking a lot of you, but there are good reasons why we're doing that. And then people will actually comply much, much better. The you give them no option. Yeah, yeah, the standard the standard user, the standard citizen out there, they they don't understand the differences and to be honest, why should they? It's not their job. They need to be involved, but we can't simply send them a, a, a draft letter, you know, now you're part of the team, now you're part of the military welcome. We need to welcome them appropriately. We need to explain to them and we need to make sure that things are not just usable in terms of interfaces, but they're also usable in terms of security. And this is where often we fail. We have gotten much better, I should say. Over the last 20 years, we've, we've, we've improved quite a lot, but there is still quite a lot of work that we need to do. I see businesses working on that. Like, for example, my bank will send me at least once a week something about passwords, about why security matters, yeah. about uh, how to use 3D. Like, but ev I guess that everybody is just ignoring the messages. Like, yeah. everybody is marked as red. And well, we are bombarded by information. That is right? true. <laughs> we are uh, we are really bombarded by information, and 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 I totally understand that people simply click on a message and mark it as red or delete it automatically. So I think it's laudable that your bank sends you messages every week. I really wonder how many people really read it. I, I, I'm also yeah. ca kind of 99% would yeah. just ignore that. But you know, there are, there, are, there are middle grounds that we can consider. For instance, uh, my university uh, a couple of years ago, like many other universities in the UK and in and, 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 and the rest of the world, and I'm sure in Bulgaria as well, they... Uh, they became really worried about cyber attacks, especially during the pandemic, but not only. And, and they decided to change the password policy. So they decided to implement a password policy that was much more stringent, where people had to change their password every three months and, and make it complex. And Myself and a couple of my colleagues in, in, in working in cybersecurity, we actually went to speak with the IT team. And we told them, listen, this is not really a great idea because you are forcing users to change their password way too often. And there are studies out there that show that if you do that, then the passwords that people will pick are actually weaker than the ones that they would pick if they had a bit more time. So if you put too much pressure on people, they will 
you know, get annoyed and they will just do it because they need to do it, but they'll do it quickly and they'll probably do it poorly. So, and I must say hats off to our IT team because we had, we had a number of very good chats and they changed the policy. So now we need to change our passwords only once a year, but in exchange, it needs to be a very good password and it is checked. Okay. And it is checked regularly. And, you know, if it is a simple password, like, you know, not one, two, three, four, but even a bit more complex than that, uh, the, the checkers, the automatic checkers will break it. And we use multi-factor authentication, which we didn't use before. So that discussion was, I must say, one of the biggest successes I had as a security expert, because it was a very interesting discussion where we tried to mediate the needs of the IT team who need to protect the university and hats off to them, you know, for the work that they do, but also the needs of the users. Because it's it's like, you know, like, like we were saying earlier on, if you send people an email every week, at some point, they'll, many of them will stop reading it and they'll just move on. But you still had it. I mean, hearing is this yeah. password policy. It obviously sounds draconian yeah. in your yeah. head. But like I've been working with with enterprises that work with banks and financials, and there you change passwords every month. It, they cannot be the same for yeah. like ages, and you log in probably yeah. ten times a day yeah. to every application. Yeah. <laughs> but on the other hand, who gets attacked more? Banks, of course, of so course. That obviously, it's because then the that's level what, of security. Is obviously, really. that's because where the money is, but it's also because where probably there is a level of insecurity added by these draconian measures. Yes. So uh, it's not really my field, but I would love to see some studies that show that actually forcing people to change their password in a bank every three weeks or every three months really improves the system. I'm not sure about that. That thing that you said about like uh, we have we have done experiments and we know yeah. that people are choosing yeah. quicker puzzles. Is it really covered by data by a real yeah, yeah. proper AB yeah, yeah, experiment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I didn't do that myself. That's not really my own area, but there are published it's an papers. Interesting there is area. research out there. Uh, some of my colleagues at Kings, but also in other parts of the world, uh, they've done experiments that provide the evidence that the resulting passwords are weaker. Not for everybody, of course. I mean, of, but, 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 in average, but the experiment, yes. yeah, did, like at least it was detectable. Yeah, it was yeah. significant. And, and you know, it was not on a study done on 20 people. It was a study done on thousands of people in different parts of the world. And what is interesting is that this is actually... Uh, across borders. So it's not that in the UK or in Bulgaria, uh, it's some... like this. No, no, it's everywhere because because users are it's users. It's new to all yeah, of yeah. us in the same time. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So then I want to probably ask you about your opinion on biometrics then because biometrics seems to to like be the, the in, in, in terms of usability, the yeah. good alternative to password. I'll have to remember my fingerprint or my Absolutely. face. Then again, the usual critique there is that uh, you can change it once it's compromised. If somebody has yeah. the, the digital ID of your fingerprint or on your face for the iPhone, you cannot change it. You no. cannot change your finger. So is there, are we, have we reached the limits of biometrics? Is it gone? Uh, is it ever going to be security through biometrics improved the usability and security? Okay. Not only the security, obviously. I mean, it's, 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 it's a difficult question. Uh, in the sense that I do feel we have gotten very, very close to the limits. Um, what we need to do is to make sure that it's not easy to replicate, right? So because that's the only possibility, right? So More uh, complex biometrics. Exactly. Um, so for instance, I know, again, not work that I've been doing, but I know that there are people out there who are carrying out, colleagues of mine, who are carrying out research on... Uh, for instance, uh, the patterns in your heartbeat, which are much more difficult to replicate and okay. understand than... But uh, can be recorded and replayed, exactly. I would guess. Well, yes, but, but you know, uh, your face can be recorded in a picture. M much, and, much, much easier. Exactly. <laughs> and, uh, so in a sense, uh, there is no perfect solution. Um, and this is something that goes back to your initial question, right? Why is security so difficult? Because there is no perfect solution. I mean, security has been an issue 
uh, with, for mankind since the beginning of mankind, because uh, obviously not cyber security, not <laughs> digital security, but other forms of security have been an issue since we had some information to protect. Since the Trojan horse, yeah. Uh, or even, <laughs> even sooner than that, you know. Uh, and, and, and that means that we have, we have used our ingenuity as humans for thousands of years to come up with solutions. And actually some of the solutions that we use today are exactly the same solutions that were invented a couple thousand years ago that just made technological and digital through technology, but that's it. Um, but in a sense, we, we are going to improve, but the attackers are going to improve. And, uh, and this is what we need to understand. So that is why we need alternatives, that is why we need backups, that is why we need, uh, you know, not just one single way of authenticating yourself, but a number of different ways, because it is unavoidable that one of them or many of them will break. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's, it's a very difficult question. I don't know, uh, out of ignorance, because that's not my field, if there is anything, for instance, in our brain waves that would make them unique and maybe not recordable. Uh, but I know, for instance, that because I've written a paper about it, that, that the moment in which we can connect our brain to the internet, which, by the way, we can already more or less Technically, do. we yeah. can right now. I mean, we just don't are, do it. Yeah, exactly. There are people who have played Tetris, for instance, through their brain waves and stuff like that. Well, that's a fascinating advancement in technology, right? Think about the possibilities for disabled people or for people who have had accidents or, or diseases, neuro neurogenetic diseases and everything so it's great but on the other hand think about the security, the security. Nightmare, right how are you going to encrypt your thoughts yeah and and what if somebody hijacks your connection to the exactly. network <laughs> exactly so um you know with the phone at least with the device in between at least there is a level of encryption but if you plug in your brain directly if, if there is uh, one of the cameras was was reading my brain waves, uh, which is not science fiction, is going to happen in a few years. Uh, then good luck protecting your passwords because yeah. you'll be <laughs> thinking about them. <laughs> <laughs> Even At if least. they're very, very complicated, <laughs> the fact that you think about them means that they're stolen. <laughs> so I, I think that this this is what makes cybersecurity so fascinating, even for the public, right? Because it is a very human problem. You know, we have been inventing, uh, you were asking me about Sofia, so we had a nice walk this morning through uh, through the, the old Roman city and we looked at the walls and everything. You know, we've been protecting our perimeters for centuries because we understood that <laughs> we want to keep the bad guys out. So that's why we build walls. Uh, but we also know that walls can be attacked and, and, and can be bombed or can, you know, or there is a back door that allows you to enter even uh, an impenetrable fortress. So that's a very human problem to have. The fact that the battlefield or that the play field, let me say, rather than the battlefield is online makes it not less difficult. On the contrary, it is more difficult. And but also much more exciting in a sense because there are a number of other opportunities out there. On the other hand, let's not forget the, the huge, huge improvement in our lives that the internet has brought. So, you know, it is a price to pay, but hopefully it is worth it. But yeah. I, I want to get you back to the topic of explaining security to to common folks. Like, yeah. uh, I know you like to, to use fairy tale comparisons. Yes. Uh, do you have a good one for our oh, listeners? Absolutely. Like <laughs> that is that is short. Absolutely. So you know, just just to introduce that a little bit. Uh, why am I looking at fairy tales and films and music and some? Be because I think that. Myself and many of my colleagues, we often talk to lay people with the same language that we use among ourselves, and that won't work, right? So people, you know, I gave this brief technical explanation at the beginning. I think I've bored already half of your audience, even in those <laughs> minutes, right? Because rightfully they say, well, I'm not interested in that. I'm, I'm ignorant. I don't even understand what, what it means to model something and so on. So I thought, okay, to talk to people and make them aware of the issues, but also aware of the potential solutions, we need to find a new narrative and we need to find a new language. And, and so I thought, okay, we actually have narratives and languages in the arts. You know, there are a huge amount of films about cybersecurity, uh, where, you know, that the, the films are about hackers, uh, 
sometimes good guys, some more, more often bad guys, uh, or people confronted with cybersecurity, or you know, even Sherlock Holmes, uh, the books and the films and the TV shows, they are about somebody cracking codes and stuff like that. So great, we have that. And, and I tried using that, and I've been you know, writing papers and, and giving talks and doing experiments on using films. And it, and it works. You know, it's a good way to, to introduce people to the subject. But then I thought, okay, there is something perhaps even more primordial rather than films. And then I thought about fairy tales and myths. Because we, as humans, have been using stories for centuries to explain the world around us, right? So that's... Uh, that's how we came up, in a sense, with religions, which are stories which that try to explain the world. And fairy tales are a perfect example because they're often cautionary tales. They're often uh, targeting both children and adults. Actually, fairy tales used to target adults originally much more than children. And they are a very good way to provide a metaphor. For and easily rememberable exactly. also. Easy, exactly. And pervasive. You ask for an example. My favorite example is Cinderella. Okay. <laughs> Cinderella is a fairy tale that is completely universal. So you can find variants of Cinderella in almost every culture of the world throughout the centuries. The first version of Cinderella dates back to more than 2,000 years ago, either from Egypt or from India, I didn't know uh, that, really. Absolutely. And, well, very, very different, of course, from the Disney but, Cinderella. But, but, that, but the skeleton is the but same. But the idea that there is one person that is identifiable through a shoe, that dates back to, to Egypt and India. And then it got coded first by some Italians, Basile and Straparola. Then uh, it got rewritten again, mainly by the brothers Grimm and by Charles Perrault. And these are the two versions the two that we know today. Modern versions. And actually, Disney provided yet another version, mixing them up a little bit. But why is it interesting? Well, because Cinderella is actually a fairy tale, among others, about multi-factor authentication. Because, you know, to make a long story short, Cinderella is living with her stepmother and their stepsisters who are very mean to her and treat her like a, like a maiden, like a slave. Basically, she works in the kitchen among the ashes, which is why she's called Cinderella. In German, it would be Aschenputtel, the girl who lives in the ashes. In, in Italian, it's Cenerentola, Cenere is ashes, and so on. <laughs> uh, but the prince of the realm decides to give a ball to pick his wife. So every maiden is invited, but Cinderella cannot go. Well, there is some magic, depending on which version of the story. She manages to go with a wonderful dress and with some wonderful glass slippers. She dances all night with the prince. The prince falls in love with her at first sight, spends all the time with her. But at midnight, the magic vanishes, so she has to go back home. As she runs away, she drops one of the glass slippers. So the prince is distraught and decides to send his soldiers out to find the one girl in the realm whose foot fits the glass slipper. And this is authentication. It's biometric authentication, right? The size of your foot determines your identity. Now, this is something that as a kid always disturbed me because... Uh, I remember actually my parents, because in, in Italy, you know, fairy tales are, are big, like I assume in Bulgaria as well, reading yes, the fairy yes, tales. Yes. And everything. Everybody and I, knows that. Yeah, and I always thought, story. well, how can it be that she's the only one whose foot is so small to fit the Or you were a critical issue? thinker. Exactly. <laughs> I, I was a very annoying kid. And I was a nerd already when I was a kid. But... Um, but, you know, actually, the, some versions of the fairy tales come up with an answer because they say, well, actually, the shoe is magical and recognizes the, the owner <laughs> and therefore changes the size. Uh, so, okay, the, the soldiers are sent around, uh, around the realm and every maiden tries out the shoe. So the stepmother, when she hears that, is very, very keen for one of her daughters, so uh, Cinderella's stepsisters, to marry the prince but their feet are too big. So in one of the versions of the story, the ones by the Brothers Grimm, not the ones by Perrault, what does the, she do? She cuts off one of, the, uh, one of the heels of one of the girls and actually one of the fingers, the toes of, of the other girl. So they pretend to be Cinderella. Actually, what they are doing is they're carrying out what is called an impersonation attack. 
But fortunately, one of the soldiers in one version, or the crows in the other version, they spot the blood trickling from the shoe because they have tried on the shoe and it fits because they have removed the toe or removed the heel. But the blood is a giveaway, so the runtime monitor that is checking <laughs> the system actually sees that. So the soldiers keep on searching, the attack is thwarted, they keep on searching, and they finally, finally, finally get to the last girl in the realm, who is Cinderella. They're very skeptical about it, but hey, it's the last girl in the realm, let's try it out. And they go to Cinderella and the shoe fits, and they're extremely happy about that. But they're also worried that it might be an attack again. So what does Cinderella do? Cinderella do? She actually produces the other shoe. And that is a second authentication factor. Okay. <laughs> so not just something that you are, the size of your foot, but also something that you have, the second shoe. And why is that important? Because it is the second authentication factor. And going back to what we were saying earlier on, if one of the authentication factors breaks, you have the other one as a backup for resilience. And in the Disney version, if you remember the Disney animated version, actually the stepmother tries out another attack out of spite and she breaks the glass shoe before Cinderella can try it on. So the soldiers are desperate because they don't have the proof anymore. But again, Cinderella so, produces the, the other shoe, shoe and it is a shoe that <laughs> matches the first one. So it provides resilience. So Cinderella is really a perfect metaphor for what our banks are asking of us, right? So they're asking us typically some biometrics or some passwords. And they're also asking us to have something, namely our device on which we re receive some messages, some one-time password or something that we type in. Yeah, and that's the power of the story because everybody knows that exactly. story. Like there is no human being that does not know that story. To be honest, I didn't know it went that far or uh, how it turned exactly. out in Egypt. <laughs> I'm going to exactly. read well, about it. You know, I've been, uh, I'm a computer scientist, but I'm also very interested in literature and everything. So when when I started working on, on, on fairy tales and, and cybersecurity and I started producing a database, you know, mapping different cybersecurity notions to the different stories, I started reading fairy tales and I read fairy tales again as an adult in my 50s for, for two years. And I ended up reading hundreds and hundreds of fairy tales from different cultures. You know, of course, we are heavily influenced by the Western culture, you know, because we think we invented everything, but actually it's not true. Many of our fairy tales come from India, from Egypt, from oh, Japan. No, these are eternal, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or, or, you know, or vice versa, or vice versa. Many of our stories have influenced cultures in other parts of the world because... Through trade, we also traded stories. And, you know, when, when people were really, you know, going on a horseback to, to, to other parts of the world to trade their goods, they also sat around the fire and, and told stories. And this is what we do as humans. So using these stories, which are a, the most human you can be if you tell about these stories, to talk about cybersecurity, to tell people, listen, Cybersecurity is difficult, but you should not be too afraid because actually many of these things, you know, multi-factor authentication, integrity, one-time passwords, um, uh, masquerading, uh, eavesdropping, and, and somebody listening, or shoulder surfing, or even phishing, they are part of who we are as humans. They are just appear to be slightly different because of technology, but the gist, the core idea is the same. The need for security exactly. is, but is also there. the solutions we invented and the problems that we faced. And that, if you do that, what I've seen, because I've been, you know, I'm a scientist, I've been carrying out experiments and I've been trying to, to measure to what extent does it really help people understand things better. And the answer is, it does help people understand things better, but not always. What is an example of such an experiment? Uh, so, for instance, one thing that we did is, uh, and I say we because I did it together with some colleagues uh, who are psychologists and, and, and social scientists and everything, we, um, we asked people questions. So we, we, we conveyed the number of participants in our surveys and we asked them questions. You know, we asked them if they knew what authentication was, what multi-factor authentication was, anonymity and the like. And we gave them a number of options to pick from. Okay? And we recorded these answers. Then we asked them to watch a movie clip. Okay? A movie clip that we had selected 
and including Cinderella, including other things, that was showing an excerpt from the movie about that property. And then we asked them the same question again. And we recorded to what extent they changed their answer and to what extent the, the answer went from being wrong to being correct. And that was a good way to measure to what extent did the film clip change their mind and to what extent did the film clip help them understand and improve their knowledge. And what we saw at the end is that for certain properties, even watching you know, a two-minute movie clip can make a difference. It's a clip from a real movie, yeah, like yeah, it's yeah. not made for the experiment. No, 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 no. We, we use real movies. We use a lot uh, cartoons, you know, the animated versions, but we use also movies like War Games, like Spartacus, like- Baby Driver. Baby Driver, <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Baby Driver and and uh, and a number of other movies, many movies with Nicolas Cage. You know, I wrote a paper which is called Nicolas Cage. I saw that you have a paper that has Nicolas Cage <laughs> in the title. <laughs> because Nicolas Cage is, the center of the cybersecurity <laughs> universe because he has been in so many movies about cybersecurity and so on. Uh, and, and, you know, we recorded the answer and we, sh we, we saw that for a large number of properties, it works. What is interesting is that we also saw that for a few properties, it doesn't work. And the reason for that is that you need a mediator. You need somebody like me explaining why that movie clip is relevant for they can make a connection exactly and uh, for instance anonymity right Anonym i was about yeah. to ask you what's the movie clip for yeah. anonymity what's so the example which we movie used spartacus the scene in spartacus i'm spartacus i'm, I'm Spar spartacus exactly. okay which is exactly the way an anonymity set is built so for 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 our viewers and listeners who don't know the film Uh, Spartacus is a former gladiator, former soldier who becomes a gladiator, a rebel, and he assembles an army of rebels and he fights against the Romans. The Romans obviously win, and all the, uh, the, the rebels have either been killed or they've had, have been captured. So a Roman general speaks to the rebels, the ones who have survived, because they have one problem. They don't know, the Romans don't know who Spartacus is. They don't know they know the name, but they don't know who he is. And so there is the speech in the film, which is actually in the original novel This is as the clip. well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Where the Roman general says, uh, your lives of the rebels are going to be spared. You'll you return to being gladiators or slaves, but you're you're staying alive. If you can identify either the dead body or the living person who is called Spartacus. So the film clip, it's, it's a film by Stanley Kubrick with, with a script by Dalton Trumbo, so one of the blacklisted writers, and it's a very interesting backstory around that. And, and Spartacus is played by Kirk Douglas. And Spartacus and his right-hand man, Antoninus, played by Tony Curtis, and all the other rebels are sitting on a hill. And they hear that. So the lives are going to be spared, if they identify Spartacus. So what does Kirk Douglas do? He is the hero. He immediately stands up. But before he can say, I'm Spartacus, Tony Curtis, Antoninus, his right-wing man, stands up and says, I'm Spartacus. And suddenly, every other rebel stands up and says, I'm Spartacus. So much so that actually, if you watch the movie clip, the only one who doesn't say I'm Spartacus is it's actually Spartacus. Spartacus. Yeah, yeah, I've seen it. It's a very, yeah. it's a very powerful scene. It's an incredibly powerful scene that has been imitated and, 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 and referenced in many other movies. So for instance, you might have seen Life of Brian by yes, Monty yes, Python. Yes, of course. You might have seen Dead Poets Society where there is the same idea. And, but basically, what, what is happening there? So the Romans, at the beginning of the scene, they have zero knowledge. They don't know who Spartacus is, right? So they ask for that information. At the end of the scene, because everybody is saying I'm Spartacus, they also have zero knowledge <laughs> because the situation is exactly the same. They didn't know who Spartacus is at the beginning. It could be any single one of them. They don't know who Spartacus is at the end because, again, it could be every single one of them. And that is anonymity, because what they build is what we call an anonymity set. And anonymity is a tricky thing, because our intuition as humans is that you're anonymous 
if you're alone and you cannot be traced. But that is not true. You're anonymous if you're one of many doing the same thing. If the anonymity set, so the number of people doing exactly the same thing is so big that you can get lost in that set. There is another similar scene, for instance, for those of you who have read the comic or watched the film in V for Vendetta, at yeah. the end, where everybody dresses up with a mask of Guy Fawkes, which is actually particularly relevant for the UK and <laughs> parliamentary bombing and everything. But because everybody wears the same mask, you are anonymous because it could be every single one of you. And anonymity is difficult because the the... the <laughs> the, 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 the intuition that we have is, you know, you're anonymous if you're alone and people cannot trace you. No, no, you're anonymous in the crowd. And that's where we saw, for instance, that the movie clip was not enough. But we also saw that if there was somebody like me giving an explanation similar to this, then people about the it. information yeah. quality about the zero exactly. information yes it, it's it's not an intuitive concept like the, the, the exactly. even just saying zero knowledge means Absolutely. means nothing I, I, I anyway wanted to touch on the anonymity topic yes. so somehow the conversation Perfect. led us there uh since our previous podcast was about telegram which is like getting bigger yeah. here and it has some promise of anonymity at some point Absolutely. of course once it's tied to a phone number it's yeah. not really anonymous and I remember some influential IT guy writing 10 years ago, like in the future, some people would, would like to pay money to be anonymous on mm -hmm. the internet for a while. So I kind of feel that nobody is anonymous on the internet right now. Uh, the, the way we've implemented, like know your customer rules, like the, your ISP needs to know who you are. Uh, most of the services you use, like Facebooks and Vibers, are connected to your phone number, which is traceable by your national ID. So... Anything that is anything that's truly anonymous, like Reddit's or random forums, uh, gets uh, like gets a lot of attention for being a breeding bed for bad behavior, Absolutely. nationalists, drug dealers, etc. So, at some point, I feel we are we are going down the path of zero anonymity on the internet. Like I also remember the early days where you you could have any nickname, you can be John Travolta with any password, and you're good. So how do you feel about anonymity on the internet? Do we have to kill it entirely? Like how would anonymity look in the future? Online anonymity, yeah. not like in person no, anonymity, no. it's clear now, I'm on the bus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's, yeah. I have mixed feelings. Uh, and what I mean with that is that I see the virtue of anonymity and I think we need at least some degree of anonymity for certain things because we can't be constantly surveilled. But at the same time, I see the dangers of is anonymity. Is it avoidable? Well, my question well, is, is, is it avoidable it is, it is to be avoidable. constantly surveyed? It is avoidable. So, for instance, you know, in certain countries, you can go to a shop and buy a SIM card without giving your name, without nothing. So that is already a very, very simple means of having some degree of anonymity. Only in this country. Only you can't this country. have this anonymity exactly. in the UK. Exactly. Let's be fair. Exactly. You cannot no, no, get a no, no. SIM card without absolutely. A absolutely. Absolutely. human uh, connection. Exactly. But for instance, I lived in Switzerland for a few years and I remember, I don't know how it is now, but I remember that at that point you could actually buy a SIM card from the supermarket 20 years ago or something. Can you like. pay it cash? I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because otherwise the credit no, card no, course, is your course, trace. Of course, <laughs> of course. Well, even if, if it was tracing, it would trace that you bought a SIM card. It didn't necessarily have the POOC and, and, and numbers. Yeah, and but everything. you would, it no, would, no, it would exactly. be assigned a, exactly. an ID. So, I mean, and, 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 and to be fair, I think that the number of countries where this is allowed uh, is, is, is diminishing, diminishing on a daily basis. The, the free forums yeah. like Reddit are diminishing. Yeah. Like Absolutely. all the anonymity is diminishing. And, and there is a good reason for that. And the reason is the Wild West that we see on the internet, right? So the, the amount of fake news, the amount of propaganda, the amount of bad information that is posted online. And one of the responses, and this, again, I have mixed feelings, one of the responses has been, okay, we're going to control it by enforcing authorship, by enforcing accountability by enforcing the fact that we actually can trace who posted that message, who posted that information. And obviously, this is exactly the opposite of anonymity, right? Because you can only be accountable if, if it is Luca Viganò and not if it is Joe Smith. Right? Yeah. Or uh, Joe Smith being an alias. Um, at the same time, there are techniques out there that achieve anonymity. So, for instance... 
there are techniques like mixed networks, which is what is, I believe, is also being considered for Tor. Telegram. Yeah, exactly, like Tor and everything, which do provide anonymity. They do rely on traffic, and that's why they are expensive because basically if you want to register, you need to your computer to be online all the time because you need to, your computer to devote some of the CPU time to actually providing anonymity to others and everything. But they do provide a large enough anonymity set and they do provide anonymity. So this guy was right that we're going to yeah. pay for anonymity. Absolutely. It costs money, yeah. Absolutely. And, it, and it's going to cost a lot at some point. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, CPU time is, 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 is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So in that sense, it's not a problem. What I think he referred to is not just the, the technical cost, you know, the, your phone bill or your, your, uh, your electricity bill, which is obviously a problem, but it's also a cost in the sense of enrolling into a service. The service, and, the service of course. And potentially there is a moral, political cost as well. Because I remember the time, again, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly old in, in the field of cybersecurity, and I remember the time when some colleagues of mine in Germany who had developed mixed networks and had set up a mixed networks in Germany, they received a visit from the police because the police was afraid that this university was actually providing an opportunity, a technology for terrorists, for criminals to actually be anonymous. And what my colleague said is, well, potentially, yes. <laughs> but I don't screen my users. And, and that is part of the cost. So, uh, you know, do we, do we agree that with, with the fact that there are certain services that don't screen their users? You know, uh, if we found out that the next terrorist attack has been planned on an anonymity system, would we accept the cost in exchange for anonymity for people? So the costs are not just economical costs, but there are moral costs, there are society costs. You know, as, it, an it is an as an individual, I can accept it, but maybe as a society, it's difficult to accept it. So, yes, these things are counterbalanced. Exactly, like. exactly. So that's why I say I have mixed feelings because I totally understand, uh, you know, the person who says, oh, uh, uh, some, some relatives of mine were killed in a terrorist attack uh, and, and the terrorists communicated on a mixed network on Tor and everything, Tor should be shut down. I totally understand that. I totally understand the individual. But I also totally understand the individual who says, I'm a political refugee, I'm persecuted in my country, and if I speak about my, my political views, my religious views, my sexual preferences and everything, I'm going to be persecuted, therefore I need anonymity. I understand them both, and, and I find it hard. And to, to some extent, I must say, I have the perfect getaway card because I can say, you know, I'm a security expert. It's not for me to judge. It's not for <laughs> me to make decisions. What I can do is I can work on the systems and I can tell you, does it work? Does it not work? Is it really is anonymous? Exactly. You can make the mathematical exactly. the mathematical model of where exactly. this is truly anonymous yeah, and the government cannot spy on you. With a high percentage. With I mean, you can never be truly anonymous, but you know, with a very, very, very high percentage <laughs> anonymous. So it's interesting because we immediately enter a territory where technology borders and, and actually overlaps with ethics, with philosophy, with your sense of government, you know, should the government be controlling you? Should the government be, not be controlling you? You know, you were asking me for example, so for instance, we, when, when I teach anonymity, I always show my students two clips. One clip, and I use movie clips instead of books because they're much more direct and much easier to show in a, in a classroom rather than ask my students to read the book, which I do, but I don't have control on that. I show a clip from the movie 1984 from the novel by George Orwell, where you have the eponymous big brother. So your television is looking into your home. So it works the other way around as well, not just you watch it, but they watch you through the television. And that is a government, it's a state where there is 100% surveillance and absolutely no anonymity. I, we kind of probably have that in China now. Uh, in, 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 yeah, probably to some extent. We don't know, and, no, but and, and, we you know, assume it's quite it's and, getting closer. And let's be honest, we're not that much better in the Western <laughs> world, right? That so, is true, that is true. And then I show them an excerpt from the cartoon South Park. 
Because in South Park, there is an episode where Butters, who is one of these kids in Colorado, is the sweetest kids. He actually says his goodnight prayers. And his goodnight prayers are not to God, but to President Obama, because Obama was president oh, okay. at the time, who is obviously listening. <laughs> and, and actually Butters is thanking him for looking after them. And actually, by the way, could he have a puppy for Christmas? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you have these two, you have these two attitudes, and I've seen them in the world. You know, you have you have the attitude that say, oh no, we need anonymity because otherwise the government will surveil us too much. And you have the attitude, oh, but I have nothing to hide, and I'm actually happy that the government is surveilling us because they can they can do good things for us. They can prevent attacks, they can prevent, <laughs> you know, terrorists and everything. And 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 you know what? The as almost always in life, these are two extremes. Probably the best solution is somewhere in the middle. But I totally understand the extremes. I totally understand the individuals, you know, because, because every individual is different and because, you know, your experiences will push you in one direction, in one extreme or the other. But actually, the majority of us, we are somewhere in the middle, right? We would like some degree of anonymity. We would like to be able to use some devices that provide anonymity, like, you know, we're very happy to use end-to-end -end encryptions on our messaging systems because it does provide some degree of confidentiality, not anonymity, but, you know. But at the same time, we're also happy that we have police that is preventing attacks. We're also happy that we have a government that is really looking after us, maybe not dictating our daily lives like in 1984. Unless but, necessary. <laughs> and, well, you know, but what I'm saying is what we need to do, and this is something where we need to work on, we need to understand the whole spectrum. And I don't think we are doing a good job at understanding the whole spectrum in many, many cases. And this is where, again, the work of us experts can really help because we need to explain the whole spectrum. Then I can't really tell you what to pick. If you ask me, I would prefer a bit more anonymity. A bit more, and a, and that a was bit the question. Control. Like, if you if it, if it yeah. gets on a personal level, yeah, yeah. what society do you want on to a, live on in? On a personal level, I don't want a, a society that controls me too much. I want some controls, but not all controls. I want some degree of anonymity because I want to be left alone to some extent, but I also don't want free for all, you know, that uh, everybody should have a gun and, and protect themselves. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't want that. So it's, it's difficult. It is, it is. And we have elections this yeah. weekend in Bulgaria. Uh, and we we're still gonna gonna go the good old way with ballots, and because the, the we talked about security, we talked about anonymity, and kind of elections are are the pinnacle of those where these need to be combined. On one hand, the government needs to check your ID that you don't vote twice, uh, that you have the right to vote, but then again, you somehow want to be anonymous, and we. We from the IT don't have a good solution right now for that. We don't have a even if. Even if we forget about the feelings of the people about like uh, voting f from my web browser, uh, do you see us solving that? Because there's always the, just just for our listeners, uh, the the problem is of course the gatekeeper, the one that sees your that sees your ID is usually the one that's gonna record the vote and if he can match the vote, like know that yeah. this this uh, this person voted for this party. So are we getting anywhere a solution that's practical? I know we have theoretical yeah. solutions, but they are not practical. Uh, we're getting there. So I think that the online voting systems are uh, improving constantly. And we have some online voting systems that do more or less work. And, and they would scale. So there are some experiments out there, some experimental systems, some experimental protocols, voting protocols, where you would achieve some degree of anonymity. But let me let me start before I tell you more about that. Let me, because you mentioned something uh, about, you know, you need to present your ID and everything. So I, uh, I've been living in the UK for 10 years. And I'm Italian, as you have guessed, from my name and from my accent. And I do come from a country where, you know, in Italy, you would need, you would get actually a voting card where people would put a stamp that you voted. And, you know, you would, you would get, uh, you would need to go to the polling station with your ID and the ID needs to be valid and with your voting card and they would check you and everything. When I moved to the UK, I was allowed to vote. I'm not a UK citizen, so I'm not allowed to vote in um 
in the political elections, but I was allowed to vote for the mayor because of the administrative elections. Yeah. So, uh, and that was a few months after I'd moved to the UK. So I, I, re I received the invite to go and vote and I go to the polling station with my passport because that's what you do. And I go to the polling station and I go to the desk where they register your votes and I show my passport and they say, no, no, we don't need that. Just tell me your name and your address. So I told them my name and my address. They looked up in the in the in the papers that they had in the documents. In the not files a that they had. It's not an online database. No, 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 no. no. They had, they had pen print, and paper. Print, thank pen you. and paper. They they saw that it was indeed my address, and they gave me my uh, my ballots, and I went to the to, to to the to the booth. I voted. I put the ballots in the box. But then, you know, as I mentioned earlier on, I'm a nerd, I'm interested in these things. So what I did is I, I thought, I can't go away. You know, I, I need to ask someone. So there was a man who was obviously the supervisor of the polling station. And I approached him and I asked him, you know, please forgive me, but uh, I need to ask you a question. You know, uh, you, you didn't check my identity. And he told me, no, nope, we don't do that. And I told him, but... I could have been anybody else. You know, uh, my friends know my name and my address, so they could have voted for me. I could vote for my friends. And he looked at me with a mix of horror, shock, and, and but also, you know, he found it funny. And he told me, we don't do that in this country. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I found it a perfect example. And we don't use passwords in this exactly. country. <laughs> And, you know, it's a perfect example. Actually, if you know the history of the UK, UK is one of the few countries in Europe where you don't have an ID card. You only have your driver's license or a passport. Like the US. Or a passport, yeah. And, uh, well, it's... And, but in... Uh, in, uh, in the UK, it's because it's one of the few countries that wasn't conquered by Napoleon who enforced ID cards everywhere. But... But it's interesting because now in the UK, there are elections in, in a month in the UK. Now, the ID is mandatory. And the government has changed it, the conservatives have changed it, not really as a way to achieve more security, because the philosophy is still, we don't do that in this country, but as a way to control, because certain parts of the Keep population voters out, yeah. Yeah, will, will not be able to vote because they don't have a passport, which is expensive, and maybe they don't have a driver's license because they don't drive, so you have no other means of proving your identity. So going back to that, uh, you know, in, in, in real life, you need to prove your identity through an ID system, an ID card, a passport or something. Online, there are some protocols these days that have been used in trial elections, which are indeed anonymous and which guarantee uh, resistance against coercion. So, you know, that people cannot force you to vote in a certain way. And also guarantee that the tally people don't find out how you voted. So we have them. The problem with these, and you mentioned the magical world that they're on, is scalability. So they, the, the prototypes that we have at this stage, as far as I know, they don't scale to elections. So why is that? What, what, can, we, can we try to simplify and explain yeah. at least the basic principle in layman's terms of how, these, how the magic happens yeah. that somehow they check my ID, so they know who I am, yeah. but they don't know who I voted for, and, you know, and it all was online. There was no paper involved. Yeah. Well, there are, there are a number of different principles involved. One of them is what we mentioned earlier on, zero knowledge, in the sense that uh, you can prove that you voted, but you cannot, and people can check that you voted, but they cannot find out how you voted. And the reason for that is that it, there is a dissociation between your vote and the proof of having voted. So the two things are kept separate. They are encrypted in different ways. They are kept completely separate. The, 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 I mean, it becomes a little bit magical for me as well because it's not really my comfort zone in terms of expertise, but I've seen some of these protocols. And basically what happens is that through zero knowledge, which I'll explain in a second, you can prove that you voted, but this is not in any way connected with your vote. And zero knowledge is, is a very interesting game because it is ultimately a game. So basically the idea about zero knowledge is that you can prove certain things. For instance, that you can prove that you're over 18 
but without revealing too much information. For instance, how do we prove that we are over 18 so we are allowed to vote? We show somebody our ID card. Mm -hmm. But actually, if you think about it, there is way too much information on that ID card. You know, there is your name, there is your tax code, fiscal code in some countries, there is your address, there is your height, there is your hair color. But actually, the original question was, are you over 18 or, or not? not? Yeah. Okay. So there are some ID cards which exist. I've seen them. They exist, which actually are completely blank. And this card has the information encoded on the card. And you would put the card in a reader. And this card would play a game with the, with the system. And the idea is that you need to win the game every single time. And after you have won it a thousand times, where every time you prove that you're over 18, mm -hmm. then the system is convinced that you're over 18. Let me give you an example, because again, we go back to fairy tales, and this is an example due to some colleagues of mine in, in Switzerland and France, which is a perfect metaphor. Imagine that there is a cave, okay? And there is a path, and this cave is a circle. There is a path in the cave, or there are two paths leading into the cave, and in the middle of the, the two paths, they join, there is a door. And this door is opened by a password. Okay. And I tell you, I know the password of that door. And you tell me, prove it. Right? It's like the same as saying, I'm over 18, and you tell me, prove it. Now, one way for me to prove it would be to show you my ID card. It's written that I'm over 18. Or to go with you in front of the door, say the password, the door opens, and now you're convinced that I know the password. But there is a problem. Now you know, you the, know password. the password. You know the password, yeah. So instead, we are going to play a game. I'm going to enter into the cave, and there are two paths. Let's say path number one and path number two. I pick a path, but I don't tell you which path I'm picking. And when I'm, front, when I'm in front of the door, I shout, I'm in front of the door. So now you tell me, come out from path one or come out from path two. Okay. Now, I could have been lucky, and let's say you say path one. I could have been lucky. I went inside the cave through path one, so I don't need to open door, the door. I just come back. So I have a 50% chance of being right or, or of coming back out of the right path without having opened the door. So maybe I don't know the password. Okay. So, but instead of doing it once, we're going to play this game a thousand times, 10,000 times. Every time I have a 50% chance of actually cheating, of not knowing the password. But the mathematics tells us that if we play it a thousand times, the chances that I win every single time, because I need to win every single time, are so slim that by a thousand games, you'll be certain that I know the password with 99.999999 percentage. And you will accept that. And that is zero knowledge. So I convince you of something. That I know something without revealing without what I know. Without revealing what I know or by controlling what I know. And this is how these, or some at least, of these voting protocols work. So I can prove that I voted by playing a similar game, a different game, but a similar one, but without showing you my vote for real. Yeah, I've also had some interest into this. That's why I, I brought up the question and, and they basically... The, the the ID the ID the proof of ID you 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 use to get a token and yeah. then then you vote with a token Excellent. so it's like you exchange an ID for a ballot, Excellent. but then like a Tor network it's like a ballot box yeah. being passed around citizens and every puts in their ballot, uh, but yes as uh, it's the same as you as you said it would not scale like it's we are still we are still have not seen an online election in any real country, right? Well, there have, been, there have been some attempts. There have been an attempt in Australia. There are some attempts in Estonia. And uh, they've been quite controversial. And part of the reason for that is not that they didn't work. They did actually work. The problem is that people expect from an online voting system more security than from a physical voting system. <laughs> and to, and, 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 again, know, the same thing again, with the locks and the yeah, passwords. Or the same thing with, with uh, automated cars, right? Autonomous yeah. cars. You know, we expect autonomous cars not to kill anyone. But actually, if we look at the amount of people that are killed by non-autonomous cars on a daily basis, 
autonomous cars are actually much better than non-autonomous cars, but we still don't accept it as a society because, because we would expect our technology to be better. And that is also part of the issues that, uh, I mean, I would agree, scalability is, is, or I mentioned it myself, scalability is one of the main issues, but the other issue is really being 100% secure, which I'm afraid is going to be very, very difficult to prove. And therefore, uh, probably people will not accept it. It's probably very difficult, both in yeah. the physical and the digital world, and probably not very difficult, simply yeah. unachievable. But but you also know, we also know, and we accept it, that many of our elections throughout the ages have been rigged. And even today, elections are rigged. And not because of fake news, of intervention of political, which is also a problem, but really physically Physic rigged, you know, physically with fake rigged. ballots. Yeah. Uh, there are attacks. And, and, and again, there is a movie there that can help. Uh, and it's called The Mafia Attack, where you can really rig uh, a physical election. You just need two attackers, one outside and one inside. And if you have that and they collaborate, you can rig any physical election. That so, is the <laughs> so, you know, uh, we accept that. We tolerate that. Uh, but we don't, we're not prepared to tolerate similar issues in an online system. And to some extent, I understand why. Because we expect the digital yeah. system to be better. We are building Absolutely. it to be better. Although, of course, the, the online system has the advantage of being times more efficient in terms Absolutely. of energy, transportation of people and yeah. ballots, etc. I, I have another question around, we're obviously in an, a big explosion of AI. Yeah. So, and AI will stand on both fronts of cybersecurity. It would, uh, it would help criminals uh, yes. and it would help defenders. It would help uh, identify uh, malicious behavior. Uh, like, is this... To, to 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 password authentication is yeah. it real is it a fake so how, do you see it tipping the scales in any direction or you see it as an equal uh equal force on both sides of cybersecurity do you think one side has more advantage from ai especially right now keeping the impact that ai yeah. is somewhat expensive like it, it's it's expensive to run it's it's interesting because um so I, I'm the head of the cybersecurity group in, at King's College in, in, in the Department of Informatics. And we have three pillars that we carry out work on. One is formal methods for security, which is, you know, coming up with models. The other is socio-technical security, which I also mentioned, you know, we think about the humans in the systems. And the third pillar is AI for security and security of AI. Mm -hmm. Because both are important, right? So we are using more and more security uh, AI to achieve security, because AI is a powerful tool to help us prevent attacks, identify attacks, and so on, you know, spots when there is something wrong in the system where perhaps there is an attack occurring, or even do a post-mortem analysis, you know, after the attack to find, att to attribute the attack to people, and there AI can really help a lot. And I'm talking about AI in a general sense. I'm not just talking about large language models, you know, chat GPT and the like, which are what People these days tend to equate with AI, which are a very important part, but there is a lot more to AI than just that. But we also look at security of AI. And this is security of large language models, security of knowledge representation systems. Of probably systems. back some explanations, exactly. like people exactly. when, when people hear security of the AI, yeah, they're exactly. like, what is this guy well, talking about? Know, <laughs> AI, AI these days is used to make decisions about the daily lives, right? So there are artificial intelligence systems, or maybe programming systems, the, the, how intelligent they are is debatable, that decide whether you're going to get a mortgage or not. And, and, and part of the work there is on explainable AI. So AI, and this is actually mandated by the European Union, the AI needs to explain We its have decisions. discussed this on Excellent. this very podcast. Even. <laughs> so it's very important that we look at security of AI in that sense. Now, going back to your question, uh, I think AI itself is, is is pretty neutral, right? So AI is a technology. It's a tool. It's a tool. It's it's not their fault. It's built in that way. You know, uh, it's it's. Uh, I remember, you know, Jessica Rabbit in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. It's not my fault. They draw me. They they draw <laughs> me in that way. And it's the same thing here. Uh, Part of the problem with AI that we're facing right now is the hype. 
So especially with large language models, chat GPT, they, 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 they're very much the hype now and people are using them, probably abusing them in the sense they're using them way too much for things where it shouldn't be used. <laughs> and, 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 and that creates issues, you know, um, because ultimately it's a system that is being trained, right? You log in, you provide your information. In some cases, people provide their personal information because they want their CV written or something okay. like that. Well, yes, great. Actually, ChatGPT and the like produce a good CV, but now they have all your information. They know where you live, how old you are, which degrees you have and everything. Do we trust OpenAI and the other systems to, you know, and Google and Microsoft to do a good job? To some extent, yes, but but it is a question that people are not really approaching. People in that are way. not realizing and, and people that. people are not realizing about how much information they They are. emit, yes, yeah. yes. Especially like I have this conversation with my father when he's searching yeah. something and seeing online ads and I'm, okay, but Google knows uh, uh, how much you make, how much money do you have? Yeah. Well, where do you travel? What camera yeah. you bought? Do you think that like it, it yeah. knows everything yeah. about you? It can profile you very good. And... From his perspective, he's he's genuinely surprised. Yeah. He doesn't it doesn't even think about the information, the information being emitted. And I was, by the way, when you were explaining about AI, I was laughing because uh, just this morning I saw on LinkedIn somebody was complaining that they caught one of your MPs in the yeah. UK like drafting the legislation oh, yeah. for to regulate AI using ChatGPT. So we actually asked AI, hey, please write a regulation <laughs> to regulate yourself because Absolutely. we are too stupid to do that. <laughs> Absolutely. And that, this is where I see the danger. I don't see the danger in, uh, in the AI itself, but I see the danger in us humans being too lazy. And, and not thinking about what we're doing and abusing the system in that way. And, and you know, history is full of examples where we have done that mistake. And, and this is where I really think we should be much more careful. And we should explain people better what the consequences are of using that tool, which is a great tool. You know, it's a great help. It can really help. It can improve the lives of people. Uh, AI is fantastic, uh, you know, ranging from robotics to large language models to decision systems. It's it's great with the AI that we have in our phone and the amount of information that we can uh, download through AI, through the search engines that do a good job. It's fantastic. But often we use it without really understanding what is happening. And to be honest, without having really received good explanations by the developers of the AI. So as always, I put the blame <laughs> mainly on the experts, not just on the users. It's both sides, yeah. like people need to think critically yeah. and we, we need to, to explain better. That is why, why like we're doing yeah. these events with Ratio, we're doing these events with podcasts and you're gonna be explaining these to people this Saturday. So I think that's a, that's a, that's a good closure to, to this talk. Thanks you, thank you, Luca, for for this participation. Oh, my pleasure.